Hello, this is Robbie Mitchell here from Head in the Cloud Development. Today I'm going to show you how to use NetSuite's SuiteScript 2.0 API, the Head in the Cloud way. We'll be coding in TypeScript using some of the tools that Head in the Cloud has created to make writing and uploading code faster, easier, and more reliable. The goals of this video are to get you set up with a development environment that can automatically upload TypeScript code to NetSuite using token-based authentication, to enable you to have SuiteScript 2.0 API IntelliSense as you type, to walk you through a few examples of real SuiteScript 2.0 scripts, to demonstrate how to upload and implement a script in NetSuite, and finally, I'll show you how to do client-side debugging of your code. This video is intended for NetSuite developers and administrators. You should have the administrator role in NetSuite to do everything I cover here. You should at least be familiar with JavaScript and basic web technologies here to understand what I'm talking about and I assume that you've at least looked at the SuiteScript APIs before. So first, let's download and install a couple of pieces of software. The IDE we'll be using is WebStorm by JetBrains, and you'll also need to have Node.js installed. You can get it at nodejs.org. Next, we'll need to install the Head in the Cloud Upload Restlet in your NetSuite account. To do that, go to Customization, Suite Bundler, Search and Install Bundles. Just type in Head in the Cloud, search, and the upload restlet should be the first result that comes up. Go ahead and install that. Next, if you don't have token-based authentication enabled in your account yet, you can go ahead and enable that now. To do that, go to Setup, Company, Enable Features, click on the Sweet Cloud tab, scroll down a bit, and click the box for token-based authentication, and click Save. Next, we need to add the HITC uploader role to our employee record. I'm going to edit my employee record, go to the Access tab, and add the HITC uploader role, and click Save. Finally, we need to create a token to use with our uploader. To do that, go to Setup, Users and Roles, Access Tokens, New. Set the application name to HITC Uploader, set yourself as the user, role as HITC Uploader, and now for the token name, if you ever work with different computers, you're going to need to create a token for each computer. So I like to put in the token name which device this token is used for. I'm on my iMac, so I'll include that in the name here. Click Save. Now don't touch anything. These codes only display once, so leave the screen as is and we'll come back to it in a couple of minutes. So now we're going to set up our coding environment. First you'll need to create a folder to hold all your suite scripts for this project. Here I've created a folder in my documents called SSV2 Video Suite Scripts. Let's open that in WebStorm. Now you'll notice that I've already added a few files here to save some time. You'll need to create each of these five files as well, so let's take a look at each of them and I'll explain what they do. First, let's look at gulpfile.js. Gulp is a tool that automates uploading groups of files. Go ahead and copy these two lines of code into your own gulpfile.js. Also here I'll mention that you may need to install gulp globally if you haven't already. WebStorm has a terminal built in here. You can install gulp with the command npm install hyphen g gulp. That should take 10 seconds or so. Second, let's take a look at package.json. When using Node.js, a package.json file tells the Node package manager which packages and versions need to be installed for this project. So this file is how we tell it to load our three head in the cloud modules that we use to validate our code against the API and to upload it to NetSuite. Now I recommend you pause the video here and get this file set up in your folder as well. And you'll notice when you save this file, WebStorm prompts you here to run the npm install command to install these modules. Go ahead and do that. The next file we'll look at is the tsconfig.json file. This file controls how TypeScript files are handled. Again, I recommend you pause the video here and get this filled in on your computer. Next, let's take a look at .hitc upload. This is the file that tells the uploader which NetSuite accounts pertain to this project, or which accounts we'll be uploading to, in other words. In this example, I just have my one demo account here. If you're a NetSuite customer, you might have your production account, sandbox, and a release preview account listed here. And then when you go to upload files, if you have multiple accounts listed here, the uploader will ask you which account you want to upload to. The format of this file is very basic. It contains a list of objects where we specify an account number, a file cabinet folder, and an account name. Go ahead and set this up on your end. Next, we need to set up our .hitc upload token file. This is an array of tokens, and you'll have a token set up for each account you've listed in your .hitc upload file. So 
So this is where we'll plug in the token ID and token secret that we just generated here in NetSuite. I'll copy and paste these values in. Finally, the last step is to set up a keyboard shortcut to use when it's time to upload our code. So open up your WebStorm preferences and go to the Tools menu and the External Tools section and click the plus icon to add a new tool. Set the name to build and upload just this file. Set the group to NetSuite. The program is gulp. The arguments are build and upload hyphen hyphen file, quote dollar sign file path relative to project root dollar sign quote. And the working directory is dollar sign content root dollar sign. Click OK, and then click Apply. Now go to the key map menu, expand the external tools section, NetSuite, and double click on your build and upload just this file command, and click Add Keyboard Shortcut. Now you can set it to whatever you like here. I like to use Command Option Shift B, so that's what I have it set to. And click OK, and now we're all set up to upload. So now we're ready to start coding. First, of course, let's talk about what we want our script to do. We'll start with something simple. Let's say that on our customer record, we have an accounting email field, and we want the email field on a sales order to automatically get set to this value. We can do this pretty easily with a client script, so let's get to it. So in my project folder, I'm going to create a SSV2 folder here. This is where our scripts will go. Now let's start a new file here in the SSV2 folder, call it salesorderscripts.ts. So at the top of every SSV2 file, we need to have a block comment with some metadata in it. First thing I like to put in here is the file name. Next we'll put in the at end script name tag, and here I'll put what I'm going to set the title of the actual script record in NetSuite. This tag isn't required anymore, but I do find it very helpful still. I'm going to name this script SSV2 Demo Sales Order Client. Next is the at end script type tag. This is a required tag, and in this example, it's client script. Finally, the last one is at end API version, which is 2.0. So, under the header comment, the next section is where we import any external modules that we're using in this script. There's one here that we'll pretty much always add, and that is script entry points from our end types module. You'll see why this is needed here in a second. Now with my goal of looking up that accounting field in mind, I need to think about which client script entry point to use. If you're not at all familiar with the script entry points, take a look at them in the NetSuite help documentation before proceeding here. So I want my email automation to happen right away when a new sales order page loads, so I'm going to use the page init entry point. To start our page init function, type in export function page init. Now this is where the entry points object comes in handy. Almost every script entry point in SSV2 comes with a context object that gives you access to the current record, execution mode, and things like that. So we can add that in here and we use the entry points object to specify that this is a client script page init function context. Now to see what this allows you to do, simply type in context dot and you'll see that this makes the current record object and the page init mode available to you. To see even more, add on current record dot and then you'll see all the methods that SuiteScript 2.0 gives you on a client record object. Let's not get too sidetracked though, we have a job to do here. I like to start simple in new scripts and do things iteratively. So let's first just hard code in a fake email so we can get something up and running here. Now to set the field value on the sales order, we can say context.currentRecord.setValue email accounting email. Now this code is ready to run. You can use the keyboard shortcut we set up earlier to upload it. This is what it should look like if it works.
Now we can create this script record in NetSuite. Go to Customization, Scripting, Scripts, New. Enter in salesorderscripts.js and click Create Script Record. Copy and paste in the name of your script. I'm going to set the ID to SSV2 Demo Sales Order Client. We can click Save and Deploy. I'm going to deploy this script to sales orders but leave it in testing mode. Testing mode makes it so the script only executes for us. Save the deployment. Now let's go to create a sales order from our customer. Check the communication tab. And there's our test email value. It works. So what we have is working so far. Now let's set it up to actually look up that accounting email from the customer. To do this, we need to use the SuiteScript 2.0 search module. So let's import that in. The format for importing a module is import, give the module a name, require, and slash module name. So first we need to get the customer ID, so let's do that here. The field ID for the customer field is the entity. Now we can do our lookup. We'll use the search module in the lookup fields method. The record type is customer, ID is customer ID, and the columns we want to look up is cust entity accounting email. Now notice the IDE is not happy with us because it knows that the ID attribute here needs to be a string. You'll see this if you mouse over it. The problem here is that record.getValue can return several different data types a string, number, an array of strings, a date, or even a boolean. So in this situation, we need to tell the IDE what type of data this is going to be. And since we're getting the value of a select field, we know that the value is going to be a string. So we can just say as string here, and that makes the IDE happy. So now we can set our accounting email variable to come from the customer values we've looked up. Now I can upload my code again and see if this works. I'll refresh my sales order, and there's our actual accounting email value. So now we'll look at this using the new Promise API included in SuiteScript 2.0. This really comes in handy if you're doing lookups or searches that take more than a second or two, because without a promise, the user is just going to be sitting there with an unresponsive browser while the data loads. Explaining promises and asynchronous design in depth is beyond the scope of this video, but I will give you an example of the formatting here at least. So most of the SuiteScript 2.0 API calls that do any database reading or writing now come with a promise mode as well. I'll leave the synchronous version of the code here for reference as we write the asynchronous version below it here. The format is very similar, but now when we're calling our lookup fields method, we add on dot .promise then the function signature is exactly the same. And after it, we use the dot then format to say what code to run once the promise has been resolved. And then here in parentheses is where we put in the values that the promise will return. Here it's customer values that we're looking up. And that's how a promise is formatted. So now I'm just going to cut and paste the code from above into the promise. And then we'll comment out line 14, since we're doing the lookup asynchronously now. Now let's upload it and retest. I'll refresh the sales order again, and there's our email value. So the last thing to cover here is how to debug your code. Let's try something slightly different here. Let's go create a new sales order from scratch. So if I go to the communications tab here, I notice there's no email. And if I check my browser console, I notice that there's a, an unhandled promise rejection error here. But what went wrong? Let's debug our code to find out. There's a really easy way to debug client-side code in NetSuite. All we have to do is insert a debugger keyword here and upload our code. Now if we reload the page with our browser console open, the code execution will pause here at my breakpoint. Now we can use the step over button to find the problem. Looking at this customer ID value, that looks like the problem because there is no customer ID. And that makes sense since we haven't entered a customer here yet on this sales order. So therefore when we try and do this lookup, 
the function fails because there's no customer ID. So to fix this, we'll go back to the code and we'll set up a second entry point so that if the user starts the sales order from scratch and then enters in a customer, it'll work in that situation as well. For this, we'll use the field changed client entry point. And again, we'll use the entry points client field changed context type to specify what our context object is here. Here, I'll say that if the field that changed is the entity field, then we want to run our code. Now, using the same code in two places is generally considered a bad practice. So what we'll do is we'll move our code here into its own function. We'll call it set accounting email. And we'll add in an if block here that says to only do the lookup if there is a customer ID. Now we see some red here in the IDE because the context object isn't defined here in this function. To address this, we can pass in the current record object and delete the context dot. Then we'll call this function from both page init and from field changed. We can pass in the context current record in both places. Now this should do it. Let's upload our code again. So now if I refresh my sales order, again the email field will start out blank, but if I enter in a customer, after the customer is set, you'll see the email field value fill in here. That's all for now. I hope you've enjoyed this intro to SweetScript 2.0 and TypeScript. Feel free to get in touch if you have any questions. Otherwise, we'll see you at SweetWorld.